me. My name is Subhiksha Sibukumar, and I'm a work experience candidate at Every Story Sri Lanka. Every Story Sri Lanka is a storytelling collective of young feminists creating a safe space for marginalized and unrepresented communities creating narratives in South Asia. As Sri Lanka faces its worst economic crisis since independence and grapples with the realities of political instability, we at Every Story Sri Lanka decided it's essential to take a look at the specific gendered impacts that have and will arise from the current situation. Therefore, over the course of this month, Every Story Sri Lanka has conducted live streams of Q&A sessions with three subject experts, each in Sinhala, Tamil and English. We have already successfully completed the sessions in Sinhala and Tamil with Dr. Bagisha Gunasekara and Kamala Vasuki respectively. So if you have missed those sessions, they are available on our YouTube page named Every Story Sri Lanka. Today, we have with us Ayushka Nugaliyata with us to conduct the session in English. Ayushka is an economist and system design associate lead at CITRA, which is Sri Lanka's and South Asia's first social innovation lab and a joint initiative between the Sri Lankan government and the UNDP. Hi, Ayushka. Thank you so much for joining with us today. How have you been recently? Thank you so much for having us. I mean, um, it's, it's such an honor to be hosted by a platform that does such good work around women's rights and advocacy around feminism and things like that. So thank you so much for having us. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm good. Thank you. How are you? I've been good. Thank you so much. And it's so great that you've seen our work and you really believe in what we do. It means so much to us. Mm -hmm. And before we get started with our session, we already have a Google form which had been released to send in any questions that any of y'all would have regarding this session. And if you also have any questions, comments or thoughts that you would like to express, feel free to comment on them in the comment sections and we'll get started then. Uh, so, Ayushka, before we get in with our theme, that is the gendered impact, could you kindly provide a brief explanation in the current crisis? And if you could explain the concepts and principles involved so everybody could understand what's going on. Sure, will do. Um, I will now just share some slides that I put together that kind of provides a very brief explainer of what has been happening. So let me just get those up. Can you see them? Yes, yes, we can. Great. Um, so I'd actually like to begin this explainer by talking a little bit about debt. Um, just a small disclaimer that um, in terms of the sequence of how things unfolded, um, this is by no means the starting point of the crises. Um, there is a reason this is said to be the most complex crises we've experienced in our post-independence history. Um, but just in terms of getting a conceptual understanding of what happened, I'd like to start here. Um, a second disclaimer that I'm providing a very simplified version of events um, as to what happened uh, around the concepts as well, um, kind of leaving out the technical nuances. So if you do have more technical questions, you can always feel free to ask us. And if we have time at the end of the session, we can get to them. Or I'm sure we can, uh, you can even submit your questions to every story and we can get back to you at a later date. Uh, I'm sure that's possible. So um, in terms of debt, I'm sure you're all aware of what debt is, but for the sake of clarity, debt refers to financial claim where a debtor borrows a certain sum of money from a creditor and has to repay the principal, that is the full payment, plus interest back to the creditor after a stipulated period of time. So the reason as to why countries might actually incur this kind of debt is in order to finance its development projects and programs, in order to meet its development goals, to see it through crisis and emergency situations. Um, and also if more money is being spent or flowing out of the country than money that is coming into the country or is being raised by the government. So to kind of plug that financial gap. Um, I would also like to flag that when people talk about public debt, it's good to be mindful that it is often defined in different ways. Um, so a narrow definition of public debt will look at the debt that is accrued by central and local governments, but you could also look at a broader definition that will include the debt that is incurred by um, public corporations, sometimes even including the central bank, uh, as well as what we call publicly guaranteed debt, 
which is debt that the public sector technically doesn't hold, but it still has an obligation to cover in the event of a default. So um, we can also categorize debt as either domestic or external debt. So domestic debt refers to the debt that the government owes to domestic lenders, for example, to the central bank via treasury securities, whereas external debt is self-explanatory. It's debt that is owed to, owed to foreign creditors. Um, in terms of external debt, country can borrow from a number of entities. They can bar borrow from multilateral institutions, mm -hmm. such as uh, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, or the IMF, um, or the Asian Development Bank, ADB. They can also borrow from bilateral sources. Um, this would be other countries and their lending institutions, such as India or China via its Exim Bank, uh, and so on or they could borrow from um, private bondholders through international capital markets. An example of this would be ISBs or international sovereign bonds, which I'm sure you've all seen in the news quite frequently in the last few years. So our death story is that Sri Lanka was a lower income country a while ago. So most of our external debt at the time consisted mainly of concessionary loans from multilateral and bilateral development institutions. And these kinds of loans were associated with longer repayment periods, um, sometimes grace periods, and very, very low interest rates of sometimes less than 1%. So they were concessionary and very favorable to our country. But Sri Lanka then became a lower middle income country in 1997 and then progressed to an upper middle income country in 2019, and then went back to a low middle income country in 2020. But um, basically we've been in this middle income category since the late 1990s. So Sri Lanka's ability to access this concession these concessionary loans has therefore decreased. So Sri Lanka began looking to other sources of income, such as international capital markets, and then started relying on commercial bor borrowings, such as international sovereign bonds or ISDs. So by the end of 2019, 56% of the country's loans were commercial borrowings, mostly ISBs, compared to just 2.5% in 2004. So we can look at why this is a bit of an issue. Um, unlike the concessionary loans, these ISBs have shorter payback periods, higher interest rates, and sometimes little to no grace periods. Um, Verity Research actually, actually recently published a brief brief, sorry, um, that indicated that while debt stock increased by 42.8% between 2015 and 2019, 89.8% of this increase was a result of the need to pay back interest on past debt. Um, on top of this interest, there are also the principal payments where the total amount um, generally has to be paid at once instead of in annual installments. So this can mean that if an ISP is repaid by Sri Lanka, there's a massive currency outflow, which leaves Sri Lanka in a more vulnerable financial position. For instance, in January this year, a $500 million ISP was paid off, which left reserves at just $1.6 billion. And I'll talk a little bit, of, a, a bit more about why that's important later. So we can look at whether this is sustainable for a country, and it is generally argued that for a country that faces significant structural weaknesses, relying on commercial borrowing isn't the best idea. Um, so what might these structural weaknesses be? One of this, uh, these structural weaknesses lies in the management of government budgets. Now, Sri Lanka has been facing considerable budget deficits where expenditure consistently outpays revenue with the exception of 2017 and 2018, where we were able to run um, moderate primary surpluses where revenue was higher than expenditure. Now, many economists have argued that this is not a case of Sri Lanka actually overspending, especially compared to other countries in the region and other countries within our income bracket, but rather a case of where this spending is being allocated as well as the fact that there are constraints on the, governors, uh, the government's ability to raise revenue, that is taxes. Um, so we can actually take a look at this. We can see over time that the tax revenue as a percentage of GDP has actually been falling. Um, and we know that GDP in Sri Lanka has actually been increasing um, over, over the last few decades. This is not reflected in the group graph here, but this is the case. And so tax revenue as a percentage of GDP falling um, isn't a very good sign. 
if we also look at the composition of taxes that we collect in Sri Lanka, around 24.7%, that is uh, around a quarter of all tax revenue that we collect was collected, collected from direct taxes. That is taxes on income or profits. Um, so many economists do argue that there might be limitations to tax people or corporations directly like this, because it depends on the state of the economy. It could provide a disincentive for FDI and investors if you're taxing profits at a very high level. And also it's difficult to collect, especially in a country like Sri Lanka, when our uh, informal sector accounts for around 70% of our workforce. Uh, and these are people that are not taxable. Nevertheless, many economists do feel that the proportion of tax revenue that is coming from direct taxes is still quite low for a country such as Sri Lanka, um, especially because direct taxes tend to be progressive in nature. That is, you tax based on the ability of the person or the firm to pay. So every person or company is charged a different amount, depending on how much they make. And therefore, these taxes might not necessarily increase the burden that is faced by the poor. Um, the other three quarter of taxes, that is 75.3% comes from indirect taxes. These are taxes that are charged on goods and services. For example, sales taxes, value added taxes or VAT, excise duties, tariffs, etc. And these are taxes um, where the burden can be passed from one consumer to another or one person to another in the form of higher prices. Um, so these taxes are generally easier to collect because they can be collected at the point of payment but are generally viewed relatively unfavorably because they're said to be generally regressive in nature. So this essentially means that the proportion of income that is spent on these indirect taxes is higher for lower income groups when compared to higher income groups. So I can take a very basic example here. Um, if I earn 100 rupees a month and I buy a bar of soap uh, and the value added tax on this bar of soap is five rupees, the proportion of my income that I spend on VAT is a lot higher than if I earn, say, 5,000 rupees a month. And so the burden of that is higher for people from lower income categories. However, people do argue that you can um, structure your indirect taxes a bit more smartly so as to eliminate the regressive nature of them. For example, you can exempt certain essential food items or household items uh, that is consumed a lot by lower income groups. And this kind of alleviates the regressive nature of these taxes. Um, but in any case, with regard to how we um, came to this situation, uh, when the new government came into power in 2019, they made several changes to tax policy, as you might know. Uh, re they reduced uh, VAT from 15% to 8%. They abolished the nation building tax on household goods and, goods and services. And the pay tax, which was removed and then later reinstated in April, uh, where the employee could essentially collect taxes with the consent of their employees. Um, according to estimates from Verite, there was a 33.5 decline uh, percent decline in the number of registered taxpayers, both individual and corporates, um, in the country and a loss of around 800 billion rupees owing to these changes in policy. So owing to these policy decisions, which weakened the government's already constrained ability to raise revenue, credit agencies such as Fitch Ratings, Moody's and SNP downgraded Sri Lanka's international sovereign ratings um, and a little bit of a fun fact, which might not actually be so fun, uh, is that Fitch Ratings has downgraded Sri Lanka seven times in the past seven years, and five of these downgrades were since 2020. Um, what do downgraded credit ratings mean? It essentially means that Sri Lanka's access to be able to borrow funds through international capital markets uh, becomes more restricted, and that there's a fall in investor confidence in the bonds that we actually um, um, uh, put on these markets. So this has then limited our ability to borrow funds through international uh, financial markets to finance our spending. And it's actually in 2020, as a result of these downgrades, that there was an increase in pressure to start approaching the IMF um, to kind of think about debt restructuring, which of course did not materialize. Um, to, so to sum up, increasing budget deficits a uh, fall in revenue, an increase in uh, spending together with less money that is coming into the country as a result of COVID, less access to external financing. All of these factors led to the central bank embarking on a strategy of money printing to cover these financial gaps. 
Um, the former governor of the central bank, Ajit Nivad Khabral, said that the central bank actually printed 1,400 billion rupees in 2029 in order to finance these gaps, which is a huge amount. Um, however, the, the side effect of doing this, even though you're able to plug those gaps, is that you're allowing more money to circulate the economy, which only builds inflationary pressure within the economy and leads to a depreciation of the exchange rate. And both of these uh, I will get to later as well. So looking at our second structural issue, this, refer, uh, this is with regard to the country's external position. Uh, so you might have heard the term balance of payments thrown around, um, and this basically refers to a record of all the country's international financial transactions within a given year. Um, so the balance of payments very quickly contains a current account, a capital account, and a financial account. And the current account is the one that contains um, the trading goods and services, earning on cross-border investments, as well as transfer payments. So if you're looking at trading goods and services, Sri Lanka has been facing continuous trade deficits, where the country tends to import more goods and services than it exports. Um, with the exception of this June, where we actually recorded a trade surplus, where our exports were greater than our imports for the first time in 20 years, um, which is mainly owing to a pickup of expert, export earnings uh, due to the fantastic performance of the apparel sector mainly, actually, um, as well as a continuing fall in exports, uh, sorry, imports. Um, Sri Lanka in general is an import dependent country. Uh, and in theory, this should be okay, so long as measures are also taken to strengthen the country's exports so that we're able to manage the deficit and so that less money kind of flows out of the country. Um, however, this is not the case. As we can see in this graph, um, we can see that exports as a percentage of GDP has continuously declined over the years. Um, and we know that GDP has increased over time, so we can see that Sri Lanka's growth has not really been export driven in very, very simple terms. Um, it also doesn't help that Sri Lanka doesn't have a very diversified export basket. Um, I can present you a very simplified picture of what happened to our foreign exchange earnings over the past few years. Um, Tourism is one of the highest generators of foreign exchange in Sri Lanka, but as a result of consecutive shocks, that is the Easter tax, COVID, um, the political and economic crises, uh, and the Russia-Ukraine war, which are both of which are key markets for tourism in Sri Lanka, uh, tourist numbers have dipped considerably. Um, a second reason is that tea exports, which account for 11% of Sri Lanka's exports in um, 2021, and previously brought in as much as $1 billion per year, um, experienced a fall in production due to the fertilizer ban. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but this also contributed towards a fall in export earnings. Thirdly, migrant worker remittances, uh, that is money that has been earned by Sri Lankan workers abroad and sent back home, have always been one of the largest sources of foreign exchange in Sri Lanka, but this too dipped. Um, as a result of the pandemic, but also with regard with, uh, to what happened to our exchange rate. Um, and along with all this reduction in export earnings, there's also been increasing currency outflows because of debt servicing and so on. Um, it also doesn't help that three quarters of, um, sorry, the three quarters of Sri Lanka's imports are actually intermediate or capital goods. Those are, that refers to goods which are needed for exports and domestic production. And only 25% of our imports are actually consumer goods. Um, and therefore the effectiveness of using tools such as import restrictions to curb currency outflows uh, should consider this as well. Um, so together with this fall in export earnings, and the downgrading of Sri Lanka's credit ratings, a falling confidence in the Sri Lankan economy, money printing, all of these factors contributed towards a depreciation of the currency. Um, so what does the depreciation actually mean? It means that the value of the Sri Lankan rupee relative to the US dollar and other foreign currencies is declining. So this means that with one rupee, you're able to purchase fewer dollars which is a horrible problem to have because when you have significant levels of foreign debt that's all den denominated in foreign currency that needs to be met while your currency is declining in value, um, this is an issue. Moreover, for um, an import dependent country, if your currency is depreciating, this means that your imports become more expensive, uh, which can then lead to inflation within the domestic economy. 
um, as a response to this depreciation, the central bank decided to artificially fix the exchange rate at 203 rupees to the dollar last September. So what this means is that the currency was fixed at an overvalued rate and migrant workers then opted to send their money back through informal or what we call gray market channels that could offer them a favorable exchange rate in line with market forces. Um, so it, it, it actually went up and on the gray market uh, to about 240 to even 280 rupees at that time. Therefore, less money was coming in through official channels uh, for Sri Lanka to then use for imports and for debt servicing. And the same was actually true of exporters who kind of held off on remitting their dollar earnings back to the country until the exchange rate depreciated to a more favorable rate for them. Um, in order to hold the currency at this rate of 203 rupees, what the central bank did was it used, it used its official reserves. So if you look at what reserves are, it refers to currency or assets such as gold that can be readily transferable and can be used to balance uh, international transactions and payments. So it essentially serves as a buffer for your country. Um, they also serve to kind of increase confidence in the economy where the higher your reserves are shown to be, the healthier your financial position is. So what Sri Lanka did is expended these reserves, essentially sold off dollars and bought rupees um, in order to, sorry, bought rupees in order to, um, so sorry, um, can you still see my slides? No worries about that, Ayushka. Yes, we can. Great, okay. Um, to, um, was selling dollars and buying rupees in order to maintain this fixed exchange rate uh, at 203 rupees. Um, however, this was unsustainable because money was running out to purchase imports and to service debt. And so the government then let the currency kind of depreciate. Um, so they, they, because they could no longer keep using reserves to this extent. Um, however, they let the currency depreciate cold turkey instead of kind of managing the float and um, putting safeguards to curb the negative impacts and the consequences of doing so, such as putting higher interest rates in to reduce inflationary pressures. Um, for context, Sri Lanka's reserves once stood at $8 billion um, at 2000, in 2018, but as of now, gross official reserves stand at around $1.9 billion. And this was as at June. Um, however, I'd also like to flag that gross reserves don't necessarily reflect how much money can be spent by a country because it also includes money that has already been committed or has conditions attached. For example, this 1.9 includes $1.5 billion um, credit swap with China or swap facility with China, which is subject to certain conditions on its usability. For example, Sri Lanka can't use it until it can show that it, that it has foreign reserves uh, amounting to uh, that are kind of sufficient for three months, uh, which of course we don't have as, as at now. Um, so if we kind of look at usable foreign reserves in Sri Lanka right now, what the central bank is saying is that they've been using these usable reserves to fund essential imports and that they are currently being exhausted. I would also like to flag that Sri Lanka has been facing foreign exchange crises for several years now. Um, if you recall, even in 2015, we kind of faced a shortage of foreign reserves leading to a BOP crisis. So we had to receive support from the IMF through the extended fund facility for $1.5 billion. Um, so clearly this is a structural issue that the country continues to face. Um, so to sum up, the most simplified way to explain how we got into this crisis would be that we have been running budget deficits and current account deficits for years now. Uh, and using debt to finance these gaps and rolling over our debt. For instance, if we have an ISV to pay off, we'll borrow some more to make that payment and then we will have to pay for that later in the future as well. So if we actually go back to debt, um, as I mentioned, in January, Sri Lanka paid off this $500 million bond, which brought reserves down to um, a level where imports of essentials such as food and fuel and essential medicines became untenable, uh, leading to power cuts uh, and uh, fuel queues um, and gas queues that we have been experiencing, um, essentially. Um, so what Sri Lanka did 
was in um, on the 12th of April, we issued a statement that announced the preemptive unilateral default on all foreign debt to the tune of something like $51 billion. Um, the country was officially said to have defaulted in May, which is the next month when we were unable to make an ISP coupon payment uh, after a grace period of a month since April. Um, and as a result of this official defaulting, credit agencies then downgraded us to what is known as restricted default status. With, what this means is that Sri Lanka is now effectively locked out of international financial and bond markets, and we don't have access to commercial credit until situation changes and our ratings improve. Um, so where we are right now is that conversations with the IMF are ongoing and they have indicated that discussions will continue to reach a staff level agreement to support Sri Lanka with what is known as an extended fund facility, which is what we applied for in 2015 as well. Um, this refers to IMF assistance that is given to a country that is facing serious medium term balance of payment issues um, due to structural weakness that will, weaknesses that will take time to address. And as such, these, uh, this financing system um, is tend to, uh, tends to be associated with a longer repayment period. Um, we don't yet know um, what this agreement will constitute, but the IMF has indicated, and this is information that is available uh, for public consumption on its website, that the objectives of its program would be to restore macroeconomic stability and debt sustainability, while crucially protecting the poor and the vulnerable safeguarding financial stability and also stepping up the structural reforms to address corruption. Um, however, it is likely that all of this will take time to be finalized. And one reason for this is that it generally does take a few months to design the program, um, but also because Sri Lanka will first need to prove that its debt is once again sustainable or at least on a sustainable pathway before the IMF can lend money to us. So what that means is that the government should be able to prove that it is able to meet all its current and future financial obligations without exceptional financial assistance or without having to default. That is what this, this sustainability means. So what this means is that Sri Lanka will have to start looking at restructuring our debt, which will require broad agreement among our main creditors. That is bilateral lenders, the largest of whom are China and Japan, as well as commercial lenders, such as bondholders. Okay, um, so while all of this is ongoing, that is IMF and debt restructuring talks, uh, both of which are kind of likely to take several months, Sri Lanka will still need financial assistance to keep afloat while these negotiations are going on. Um, and this is what we call bridging financing. So the longer these negotiations will take, the more bridging financing Sri Lanka will need in the interim. So this financing can be obtained by appealing to bilateral donors such as China and India, both of whom have expressed interest in supporting Sri Lanka during this time. But at the same time, the World Bank, for instance, has announced that it does not plan to offer any new financing to Sri Lanka until the country proves that it has an adequate macroeconomic framework in place that will focus on addressing economic st stabilization and the root causes of the crises. Um, it is also important to kind of understand that this will be the 17th IMF program that Sri Lanka will receive, indicating that we keep we seem to keep experiencing these problems that result in us having to keep returning to the IMF. And of the 16 previous programs that we've embarked on, we've only seen nine to completion. So one of the most critical requirements of the economic plan that Sri Lanka pulls together is that whatever longer term policy measures are included, and there will be quite a few, in order to address structural weaknesses, these policy measures need to be seen through regardless of any changes in government. So these changes essentially need to stick. Um, so we've kind of touched on this at several points of the presentation already. But I would like to briefly discuss the inflation that we're seeing today, um, which is a year-on-year -year inflation rate of 60.8% as of this July. Um, the forces that have led to this inflation rate um, include a reduction in agricultural production due to the fertilizer ban, increased imports for food and basic necessities with a depreciated currency, increased money printing, uh, and so on. So it's kind of a multifaceted um, um, issue. Um, and this is quite intuitive, but to look at why inflation is so bad for an economy, 
it tends to act like a regressive tax um, because it tends to impact the poor the most. Furthermore, if you, if you want to actually start curbing this inflation, the central bank will have to take measures such as increasing interest rates, which we have actually seen over the past few months. Um, and this can result in a curbing of growth because it increases the cost of borrowing for firms as well as for individual consumers. Um, I've also seen some discussion around Sri Lanka experiencing hyperinflation, and I'd like to address that um, because hyperinflation actually commonly refers to a situation where the month-on-month -month inflation rate exceeds 50%, whereas we are in a situation where the year-on-year -year interest rate is 60.8% as of now. So we aren't experiencing hyperinflation, but there's very little doubt that even without hyperinflation, the situation is very dire. Um, we can also take a look at what food inflation is like or how much food prices have increased compared to what they were a year ago. Um, and these statistics are freely available on the Department of Census and Statistics website every month. Um, in June, the year on year food inflation was 80.1% and in July, this rose to a staggering 90.9%, which means that food prices have increased by 90.9% from last July to this July. Um, the persistent food inflation that we're seeing is a result of the interplay of several factors. And one is that food prices and fuel prices are increasing globally. And this is also a result of the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, which has disrupted supply chains around the world. Uh, and also because I think Ukraine was a net exporter of wheat. Um, and a second factor is the SNAP chemical fertilizer ban that was imposed last day in April and then later repealed that same year at the end of November. Um, this ban combined with very bad weather, weather conditions led to a fall in crop yields, which impacted the produce of the Maha season between April to March. And this will likely continue on to the next cultivation as well. Um, so with rice, it led to a fall in crop yields of 40%, according to the Minister of Agriculture. And um, with tea, which is one of our key exports, as I mentioned previously, led to a fall in production uh, by 18% between November to February. So for the first time in decades, we've actually had to import rice to a tune of around 450 billion, uh, sorry, million rupees. Um, so this together with the fall in export earnings from um, items like tea also contributed to a foreign exchange crisis. Um, and unfortunately, together with inflation comes food insecurity. So the WFP recently announced in its most recent situation report that 6.26 million people, that is two, three out of 10 households in Sri Lanka are currently food insecure. Um, the WFP also indicated that a majority of households are undertaking food related coping strategies, such as eating less preferred food, eating less nutritious food, and also reducing the amounts of food that they eat. Um, in fact, two out of five households are said to not be consuming adequate diets. Um, the food situation is of course worse uh, among people living in the estate sector where more than half of households are food insecure and using more coping strategies. Uh, estate populations are already turning to credit, for instance, to purchase food and other necessities. Um, finally, in terms of where we are now, I think it also might be useful to look at the latest available statistics that we have on poverty. Uh, now, these statistics are based on data from 2019 collected by the Department of Census and Statistics, and so reflect a pre-COVID and a pre-crisis Sri Lanka. So we can only theorize and extrapolate what things must be like now using this data as kind of a springboard. Um, so a common poverty indicator that is used all over the world is the headcount index or the headcount ratio, which is simply the proportion of the population that is said to be living in poverty. So if you look at 2019 data, our official poverty line is 6,966 rupees, which is an estimate of how much a person needs to spend per month to fulfill his or her basic needs. So it's 2019 at this poverty line, the headcount index was 14.3%, which means that 14.3% were estimated to live, be living in poverty and spending less than 6,966 rupees every month to fulfill their basic needs. Um, Another indicator that is kind of growing in popularity and presents a little bit more of a holistic 
view of what actually constitutes poverty is the multidimensional poverty index, which takes into consideration deprivations that go beyond income. So it looks at things like education, health, and the standard of living, where the standard of living looks at things like housing, assets, sanitation, access to drinking water, cooking fuel, and so on. Um, so in 2019, 16%, so that is around one out of six people could be categorized as multidimensionally poor with deprivations in access to uh, health facilities and cooking gas being the highest. And heartbreakingly, uh, the child MPI, which kind of looks at children between the ages of zero to four, indicated that 42.2% or more than four out of 10 children are also multidimensionally poor in this country. Now we know that the situation has changed drastically since 2019 and that the cost of basic needs has increased exponentially due to inflation. Um, so though we don't have official statistics to verify this, it's safe to say that the number of people in Sri Lanka that have fallen into poverty has increased considerably uh, and their deprivations have also intensified. Uh, for instance, with the onset of the pandemic and the economic crisis leading to fuel and gas shortages, we can only imagine that these already high deprivations in access to health facilities and cooking fuel have only intensified since then. Um, the most recent poverty estimates that I've seen are those that were released by the World Bank, considering their international middle uh, income poverty line of $3.20. And this indicated that poverty increased between 2019 and 2020 from 9.2% to 11.7% owing to the pandemic, which effectively translates to around half a million people falling into poverty. Uh, but the most recent estimates actually suggest that poverty reduced in 2021 because of some kind of recovery in the economy during that year from the pandemic. And we might have to think back a little bit to remember this recovery, but um, these figures don't take into account the acute crisis that we've been facing since, I would say the end of 2021. So we'll just have to wait and see what estimates of this fallout might be. Um, so that kind of concludes a very brief explainer of where we are today. Um, and I'm sorry, I kind of took a little bit of time on this, but I thought it was important that we kind of reflect on the basics of why we are where today, uh, at this point today. Yeah, definitely. And don't worry about the time. Um, and also, I really loved how you explained this economic concept in a way that uh, non-economics people who've studied economics or have much knowledge on economics could also understand. I think it was beautifully put together by you. So I, we actually do have a question from um, one of the people who are viewing. Sure. Um, that is, if you could explain what a Sri Lanka savings has now dropped in value by half during this economic crisis. Um, I can think of two reasons as to why this might be. Um, one would be, as I mentioned, inflation. Inflation has kind of eroded the real value of the money that we hold. Uh, for instance, if we held 100 rupees a month ago, it would be able to purchase less now compared to a month ago. So this has kind of eroded the, the savings that we hold, the value of the savings that we hold. Um, and a second reason could be a result of the currency depreciation, which as I mentioned, the rupee is able to purchase less in terms of dollars than it was able to previously. Um, so those are two reasons as to why um, the money that we hold as Sri Lankan citizens um, has eroded um, as a result of the economic crisis. Thank you so much for that insight, Ayushka. So now that we have a basic idea of how the current economic system has been prevailing in Sri Lanka, we will now explore into our theme for today, which is the gendered impact in the economic crisis. So before we get on in our conversation about gendered impact, if you could kindly explain to our audience, what is the meaning of gendered impact? And if you could also touch on the objectives of analyzing something, in the perspective of gender impact? Sure. Um, so when you're looking at the gendered impacts of an economic crisis, you are considering the impacts of the crisis and whether there are differences in the way in which these impacts are being felt by men and by women. 
Um, so to your question, the reason as to why this is important or the objective of doing so is in order to identify if the crisis is perpetuating or whether it's broadening or narrowing um, the gender inequalities that are already so entrenched in our society, whether we are further excluding or marginalizing already vulnerable groups of people and whether the impacts of the crisis are placing a greater burden on some groups of people versus other groups of people. Um, and related to this, I think it is important that when you're considering the gender, gender impacts, to think also about the intersectionalities between gender and other aspects or identifiers of a person. Uh, for instance, if you're a woman and you're a single mother, mother from Jaffna Muletu, um, or you're an estate, se uh, estate sector worker from the hill country, you're likely to face um, deeper or just different impacts of the economic crisis than a middle-income woman from Colombo. Um, similarly, if you're a queer woman or you're from the LGBTQIA plus community, uh, you face a whole host of different issues than a straight woman would. And perhaps these issues would also differ depending on where you lived. So income, geography, race, religion, caste, uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, um, being a person with disabilities, together with gender, all of these intersectionalities can and should be considered. Um, I would also separately like to flag that if you are considering um, the crisis through a feminist lens, uh, I would also like to point out that the patriarchy affects not only women, but men too. Um, an example of this would be the burden that is often placed on men in the household to kind of stick to social and cultural norms, to be the breadwinners for the household and really bear that financial burden. Um, just as much as social norms perpetuate power dynamics within households that force women to stay at home and look after children or, you know, dependents and elders, as opposed to be able to work or gain an education. Um, to speak more about the gendered impacts of, on men, we can also look at the fact that a few years ago, Sri Lanka was recorded to have a very, very high suicide rate globally. Um, and most of these suicides and suicide attempts were actually um, by men and were linked to mental illness and substance abuse and alcoholism. Um, and so uh, a potential impact, um, a potential gendered impact of the crisis could be that men are simply more susceptible to substance abuse and mental illness. And these factors do need to be considered. Um, and related to this, I also think that men might have face the brunt of outright physical violence that might have emerged as a result of frustrations that have been mounting during this crisis. I mean, I've lost count of the number of shootings that have happened over the past week, um, for instance, but to kind of tie all this together, I think the importance of considering all these different aspects really comes into play when it comes to policy making. Uh, because when you're choosing what policy measures to uh, design and implement to see Sri Lanka through a recovery process, these policy measures should take into account the different impacts that different communities are facing as a result of the crisis and should be tailored accordingly to ensure that this uh, recovery is truly inclusive and truly effective and ensuring that nobody is left behind in the process. Definitely. I think that's a wonderful reflection of how gender impacts is especially prevailing in a South Asian region like Sri Lanka, where there was a time where it was so normalized, where we didn't really question it. And now, especially with these examples that you provided that we can see and notice every day in our lives, personal, professional, people we know, people we may have heard of, so we could actually question on it and acknowledge that this is not okay, this should be changed, we should move on towards a more recovery stage, as you so beautifully put it. And Ayashka, who, in your opinion, which type of women would suffer the most under this current economic crisis? And if you could provide a detail on what would some of these gendered impacts of this crisis would be? Okay, I actually, I'll put up the next slide because mm -hmm. that kind of... Uh, Kind of touches on both your questions. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so with regard to um, some groups of women that have had to face the greatest hardships during the current crisis, um, following on from the pandemic as well, I think we would have to consider women in the informal sector, such as daily wage earners with no job security or safety nets to support them through 
bouts of having no work, uh, being unable to get to work as a result of the fuel crisis, being in, uh, unable to earn a wage that could pay for the three meals a day that they could previously afford before inflation actually went rampant. Um, the lack of social protection for workers in the informal sector is not a gender specific um, issue, but it is certainly aggravated for women because research suggests that structural inequalities, structural gender inequalities have led to women in the informal sector being concentrated within low paying and low skilled jobs that offer very little to no job security and very poor working conditions. So it is likely that women were hit pretty hard. These women were hit exceptionally hard during the crisis. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting because if we're looking at gender impacts of the crisis, um, if you look at education, in terms of educational outcomes, women actually tend to do pretty well in Sri Lanka. Um, research suggests that women tend to stay in school uh, longer than men. They fare better at their O-levels, their A-levels, and when it comes to university entrance. But when it comes to joining the workforce, uh, female labor force participation is often affected by factors such as uh, working environments, the nature of work, harassment and discrimination in the workplace, um, an unwillingness to kind of take public transport to work because of said harassment, um, a lack of support for working mothers, um, and kind of social perceptions around the type of work that women should be engaging in. Um, so as a result, in spite of better educational outcomes, we found that in 2020, the labor force participation rate uh, for men was 71.9%, but for women, it was really low, uh, 32 point, uh, at 32%. And this has been the case for several years now. Um, a study by UN Women actually showed that between 2019 and 2020, um, in the study sample of firms, women's employment declined by 8% versus a decline in 5% of employment for men. And this was a result of skilled female employment in the hospitality industry halving uh, as a result of the pandemic. So I think it is safe to say that the impacts of this crisis might reflect similar disparities in terms of women being more likely to lose their jobs during the crisis. Um, and I think it is also important to remember the consequences of this would be a lack of income and a lack of social security means that they would be facing a lack of economic empowerment within their household, which can then lead to a further imbalance in household uh, power and gender dynamics. Um, additionally, a significant reason as to why women don't join the labor force or have to leave their jobs or lose their jobs um, is because of a disproportionate burden that is placed on women in terms of care work or what is known as invisible work. Um, women tend to face the double burden of having to earn an income while also having to perform unpaid care work at home in terms of cooking, cleaning, looking after children and so on. Um, these unequal care responsibilities tend to contribute towards what we call time poverty, where engaging in this care, care work basically takes away the time that they could have invested in work or education or leisure. It could also lead to limited mobility and poor well-being among women because it, in effect you're basically working longer hours um, if you're also employed in the traditional sense in addition to this. Um, it is also likely that this burden has increased in the wake of the crisis um, due to the pressures of having to adopt coping strategies, such as finding affordable meals for your families, uh, finding ways to cook and perform household work in the absence of cooking gas and power cuts. Um, for instance, an article that I read by the Colombo Urban Lab a few days ago indicated that as a result of a recent hike in electricity tariffs, many women from lower income households in urban areas are resorting to energy saving coping strategies such as switching their fridges off and having to wash the clothes by hand, etc., all of which results in more time that women have to spend on household, uh, housework um, during the crisis. Um, I would also like to point out that women do make up a significant proportion of uh, the export industries that Sri Lanka has been relying on during the crisis. For instance, they make up 78% of the apparel sector and a majority of the plantation sector and the tea industry, um, as well as a significant proportion of migrant workers who are women uh, and who, on whom we've been relying to kind of send money back and keep Sri Lanka afloat with their foreign exchange earnings. Um, so, and I think this kind of deserves recognition and due consideration in spite of all the challenges that the crisis has uh, presented women during this time.
in terms of um, the gender impacts on women, I don't think that we could continue without talking about impacts on health and safety. Um, with regard to the impact of the crisis on health, um, the lack of foreign exchange uh, unilaterally has resulted in a shortage of essential medicine um, across the board. Um, but UNICEF also recently noted, uh, noted that the fuel crisis has impacted access to essential services, medical services for women and children. For instance, um, um, this has led to women not being able to access hosp hospitals for childbirth, which has led to an increase in home deliveries. Um, furthermore, as households lose their spending power um, due to falling incomes and due to inflation, it is possible that essentials such as sanitary napkins, essentials for women, which are already expensive for lower income households, will have to be foregone, um, which could then lead to consequences for women's health and hygiene and their well-being. Um, Another important gendered impact of the crisis uh, relates to the impact of the fuel crisis on the mobility of women and their ability to navigate public spaces safely and without fear. Um, a very popular UNFPA study from 2015 indicates that 90% of all the women that were surveyed said that they experienced sexual harassment on public transport. And this is not a surprising statistic to anybody, I'm sure, um, to put it mildly. Um, with the fuel crisis limiting private transport, people have had to shift over to using public transport. So that's overcrowded buses and trains. And this kind of presents more opportunities for harassment of, of this kind for women, which could lead to them having to kind of suffer through it as a coping strategy, which will affect their mental well-being or leading to them having to limit their movements and mobility. Um, and finally, during the pandemic, we also saw an increase in sexual and gender-based violence um, or reported incidences of sexual and gender-based violence. Um, it is very possible that this too would be a gendered impact of the economic crisis, given the fact that there is mounting frustration, uncertainty, financial insecurity, food insecurity leading to hunger, a lack of access to basic needs being met due to inflation. And all of this can translate to violence that is then directed towards women and children at home. And the use of alcohol and substances also can increase the likelihood of this happening. Um, I read an article recently, and hold on, let me get up that statistic. It said that the National Committee of Women's 1938 hotline received 3,489 calls in 2021 from women seeking help from domestic abuse incidents. And this is triple the number of calls that was experienced in 2020. Now, this is a very real threat to the lives of women and children and often went underreported and unaddressed even in a non-crisis context and a non-pandemic context. Um, and to add to this, the already limited existing and like very stretched resources and um, services that would go into things like women and children's desks at police stations, women's shelters, access to mental health support services could be further limited as a result of this crisis. And this could result in women not getting the assistance that they need. Um, super worryingly, um, a fallout of this crisis has also increasing reports of women turning to sex work and brothels as a means of coping during this time which only increases their vulnerability to exploitation, to violence, and threatens their sexual and reproductive health and their dignity. Um, an organization called the Stand Up Movement Lanka um, reported that there has been a 30% increase in prostitution in the last few months, with many of those women saying that they have turned to prostitution as a result of having been laid off their jobs and in order to provide their families with three meals a day. So this is a very non-exhaustive list of the gendered impacts of the economic crisis on women. I'm sure there are plenty more, um, but it should provide you with a little bit of insight into how different impacts um, are felt by different groups of people. I think the statistics that you've provided with are quite alarming, and I think that would just be the tip of the iceberg. And all the unreported and unknown uh, cases, it just goes into the shadows. And I think that's the sorry side of one of the impacts of the crisis that it has on the gender. And um, as you mentioned about the impact of the fuel crisis on the economic sector, if you could um, kindly emphasize more on how its impact would be on the productivity of, the, of women in the workforce and how it might hinder it. 
Sure. Um, I think it's also in terms of what we discussed previously in terms of you know, having to take public transport to work and switch over from private transport, which has become more expensive uh, and because it's become more difficult to source fuel during this crisis, um, having to switch over to overcrowded modes of public transport is already a factor that has discouraged women from working. Um, but it could, because of the fact that they're exposed to increased harassment, um, this could actually impact their well being and their productivity in the workplace. So, um, yeah, I think hopefully that answers your question. Yes, definitely. And I think uh, one of the challenges that women face is uh, the shortage of food, as you correctly mentioned earlier. So if you, as you mentioned about how, um, you know, starvation and how inflation has led to food shortages, could you also mention on the impact that it would have on children and the upcoming generation? Sure. Um, I think we've already spoken about the impact on women in terms of the fact yes. that their care burden increases because they have to actually now find, find affordable meals for their families and all alternative streams of income. But um, that's a good question in terms of children. As I mentioned previously, um, the MPI or the multidimensional poverty indicate, uh, index indicates that four out of 10 children are multidimensionally poor. But in addition to this, it also indicates that one third of children between the ages of zero to 4% are multidimensionally poor, but also underweight uh, or stunted. And nearly half of all children under the age of one year, um, as well as four years, are poor mainly as a result of undernutrition. Um, so UNICEF has already indicated that Sri Lanka is, I think, one of the top 10 countries with the highest number of malnourished children. And it is likely that these numbers are going to only increase as a result of this crisis and the food insecurity that households are facing during this time. Yeah, and now that we are in the topic of children, um, looking into the educational sector, considering how even before the crisis started, starting from COVID itself, and uh, it being prolonged into the uh, economic crisis where not just schools, but even universities have been closed for a quite a long time, exams have been postponed. What are the long-term consequences that the closure of schools and you know, not having access, there are some rural uh, area, children from rural areas would not even have access to the virtual learning platform. What impacts would they have, especially in terms of gender? Do you think it's going to be equal or is it going to be biased towards one gender over the other? I think off the top of my head, I can see two potential long-term consequences. Um, one would be that it would limit access to education for girls. And while this isn't too much of an issue for Sri Lanka at present in terms of educational outcomes, as I mentioned previously, it could lead to a further reduction in labor force participation rates. Um, if less women are educated and are able to and are less able to find formal employment for themselves. Uh, and the other related issue to this uh, with regard to education is the fact that there are gender disparities depending on the stream of education that is selected, uh, where women tend to opt for courses within the social sciences and arts and humanities, um, as well as nursing, whereas men to be, tend to be concentrated more in engineering and like computing and STEM subjects. Um, so this can actually affect job prospects and widen the skills gap between um, what is demanded in the labor market and what is actually being studied by women. Um, the second consequence relates to the care economy. Um, during the pandemic, I'm sure anecdotally, we all know women who had to work full time uh, remotely, which often resulted sometimes in longer working hours, but, but they also had to see to their household chores. And on top of that, had to bear the responsibility for the children, children's education in terms of making sure that they sit in on their online lessons, do their homework, supervising them, etc. So it's kind of like a triple burden. Um, since kids have been doing this since the start of the pandemic, <coughs> it's possible that this aspect of uncared, uh, sorry, unpaid care work that women do could become increasingly normalized. Um, sorry, give me one second. Definitely. And actually, sorry, one more impact um, that can actually relate to men. Boys tend to drop out of school a lot earlier than girls, particularly during secondary years of education. Um, and these few years of not having easy access to schooling, for example, as you very well mentioned in rural areas, um, there is a digital divide. 
So if you don't have access to devices to be able to access online schooling, or if your schools don't have enough resources um, to kind of offer online schooling, and, as, and combined with increased financial pressure at home, uh, this could lead to an increase in dropout rates, which might actually impact boys more than girls, um, but could also impact girls as well. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for that no insight. Problem. And also, do you think if there would be a risk when there is a cut to social security and what would be the gendered impact on women? Um, yeah, I'll try to keep this brief, but it seems that if the government wishes to secure IMF funding, a strict condition appears to be that while fiscal, fiscal consolidation has to take place in terms of cutting down in, on spending in certain sectors, um, spending on alleviating the impacts on the poor and the vulnerable will have to be increased, which should ideally result in an increase in social security spending. Um, but this, of course, remains to be seen and confirmed in terms of the plan that the government does pull together. Um, but all indications at present is that social security spending should increase if we wish to obtain the extended fund facility. That actually was a really good insight. And um, we, so far, we've discussed on so many different aspects of gendered impact. We're starting from employment to taxation, health, nutrition, safety, and violence. We considered so many areas. And what do you think is the greatest risk from all the areas that we have focused on that could have a gendered impact on women? Like what is at the top? I think the greatest risk lies in terms of I think this is maybe not such a gender specific thing but in terms of eroding incomes and having to face inflation trying to be able to source food and basic necessities for households um, and of course the gendered impacts of doing so in terms of increased burdens on women but I think this is likely to be the increased the, the, the biggest um, threat to women's well-being um, in the coming years um, but I guess in terms of longer term risks, um, something that we could also talk about um, could be climate change. Um, because that's, that's kind of not something we touched on, but that is something that Sri Lanka is um, continually facing um, in terms of disasters every year and is going to be an increased risk as we go forward. Um, it tends to impact men and women differently. Um, where in the rural sector in Sri Lanka, as a result of like the women, women's traditional role within the household, they tend to be responsible for things such as um, household water, family gardens, uh, the livestock, taking care of livestock and things like that. Uh, so they tend to be in the front, on the front lines when it comes to actually managing the impacts of climate change and disasters. Um, and this is particularly acute in areas in the dry zone. Um, where there are a large number of female headed households, as you know, as a result of the conflict. Um, so during things like um, drought situations, and we faced uh, like a horrible drought last year, uh, women tend to be the ones that have to walk, you know, um, travel some distances to be able to access clean water for their households and things like that, which also results in time poverty, um, as we spoke about previously. So that's just not something that we touched on previously as a result of the crisis, but something that I would like to flag as an increased risk for women, uh, women going forward. Yeah, I think climate change is something that we definitely cannot shove in a corner, even though it hasn't been a top of priority in an economic crisis, it definitely cannot be ignored. And um, now that we've considered so many shortcomings and so many issues um, with, in relation to gendered impact during this economic crisis, uh, what means can actually be taken to consider and address these gendered impacts in a more sustainable manner? So at the country level, um, I think that an important way in which a consideration of gendered impacts can come to the forefront of policymaking is by increasing female representation in political spaces. Um, women account for 52% of the Sri Lankan population and yet representation in parliament is just 5.3%, which means that there are only 12 MPs out of 225 who are women, uh, and none of them are Tamil or Muslim, since we're talking about intersectionalities, and the current cabinet holds no women. Um, 
And even in terms of local government, women tend to account for less than 5% of provincial council seats. And although there is a legal framework, I believe um, that calls for quota of female representation within local government and local authorities, uh, the election commission doesn't have any mandate beyond um, nominations. Um, so I, I feel that in order to meaningfully recover from this crisis and to overcome its gendered impacts, women need to be consulted and represented at all levels of decision making. And this should include not only women from elite classes or higher income brackets, but women from all social classes and sectors, for example, working class women or estate sector women and so on. Their, their voices need to be represented in the political sphere. Um, this could be through policy measures to kind of rethink campaign financing, mm -hmm. to improve the transparency around nomination processes within political parties, um, as well as efforts to reduce violence against women during election campaigns, uh, as well as uh, tackling social norms that prohibit women from entering formal spaces of power. Um, so I think that's one. Um, secondly, I think that once economic activity starts to pick up eventually, um, and I'm hoping this happens sooner than later, um, there should be measures to encourage female labor force participation in jobs that would offer them financial security and economic empowerment. Um, so measures to allow for greater flexibility in working hours to support women with families better. For example, uh, policies that can promote more female-led uh, small and medium-sized enterprises and entrepreneurs. Uh, reskilling and upskilling of women to plug the skills gap that we sometimes find in the labor market when it comes to women um, could go a long way to support their income generating cap capacities and in doing so increase the resilience of households to combat the risk that we just talked about of you know a uh, lack of income generation and uh, equally huge risk of things like food security. Um, finally I would like to talk about in line with both of those points um, the need for gender responsive budgets. Um, in a nutshell, gender responsive budgets refer to budgets that work for everybody by ensuring that there's kind of an equitable distribution of resources across all genders and equal opportunities for everybody. So it kind of has an overarching aim of gender equality. Um, ideally, such budgets should be able to assess the impacts of, uh, you know, allocated spending and programming on men and women so that you can then tweak it to ensure that there are equal benefits for both men and women. Um, for examples of gender responsive uh, budgeting measures that could be taken could be like an increase in spending on sexual and reproductive health, um, a reduction in taxes on sanitary napkins, which women's groups have long been ad advocating for uh, policies for ensuring safety for women uh, and increased spending on ensuring safety for women in public spaces and transport systems, um, introducing maternity and paternity benefits to encourage a sharing of household care burdens as John Keels recently did um, and things like that. So Verity Research actually um, has been reporting on how, how well Sri Lanka has been adopting gender responsive budgeting. Um, and the, the former state ministry of women and child affairs actually established a set of KPIs. Um, it's just that performance in achieving these KPIs has been rather limited with many challenges in terms of monitoring um, and oversight. But I think this only, um, this only reiterates the need to kind of strengthen the collection of say gender disaggregated data so that we're able to evaluate gendered impacts of different policies and programming measures um, and also increase oversight and kind of incentives for government institutions to kind of really take on board a goal of gender equality. Definitely. I think some of these policies and um, suggestions that you just mentioned are very sustainable and are very apt for the long term as well. And even though some of them might include dismantling how the system had been functioning and progressing so far, it's definitely good for the overtime. And um, I think uh, the one last question that I have for you is that, uh, do you think that anything could be done by the ordinary person to overcome this gendered impact for the sake of all those who have joined us on live and who would watch this when it watch this um, session much later as well. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, I'm a firm believer in um, the fact that there are actions that we as individuals can take to get through this crisis, 
that kind of doesn't worsen gender inequalities. Um, one measure that I can think of is paying attention to the distribution of care work within our own households and seeing how we can share it better. Um, if we can see that one member of our family is overworked and juggling multiple tasks and chores, how can we better support them during our free time? Um, the fact that we've been through a pandemic and an economic crisis that has led to multiple challenges and stress within households, from power cuts to finding gas to having to stand in queue, uh, queues for days and um, all of these have been extremely stressful events. So perhaps taking the time to be a little empathetic and help each other out in our daily activities could help to reduce any overwhelming burdens that any one member of the family would bear. Um, I also do think that there's room for men to be allies and to do their part to ensure that women feel safe in public, especially as the fuel crisis continues. Um, speaking from personal experience and the experiences of so many women that I know who have had to walk and cycle and switch over to public transport during the crisis and having to go past fuel queues, etc. Even in broad daylight, it is very possible to feel very uncomfortable and very unsafe. And even in those situations, if you if you see a woman being harassed or subject to a derogatory language, it is possible to stand up and to kind of shut those people down and play a part in creating a culture around an, like zero tolerance towards harassment uh, in any form. Similarly, if you know of any women that are subject to violence at home or uh, subject to harassment or discrimination in their workplaces or with their intimate partners, there are steps that you can do to support them uh, to get help. Um, and finally, and I think this is on a larger scale, perhaps something that we can think about is when we are electing our next round of public officials to kind of exercise and place civic pressure on ensuring that there is female representation in policymaking or, or, or in the very least that the people that are contesting are, will think about gender issues and are empathetic uh, and want to take action against um, the specific issues that vulnerable groups, including women, are facing. Yes, and I think that it's a beautiful note to end our conversation in how you touched on the diversity and the representation which matters and some of the suggestions that you made that everyday people could make sometimes, you know, it's just a bare minimum that you could do. Absolutely. And it's so sad that, you know, it hasn't been done yet, but we can look forward to a positive future. So Ayushka, thank you so much for joining our session today. And I personally, I gained so much of insight from all the policy measures and the insights and the concept that you so beautifully curated uh, in a way that anyone can understand and you don't need to have an economic education background or experience. And thank you so much for taking time off your busy schedule and having this conversation with us, with every story. Thank you so much again for having me. I really enjoyed it. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. It was our pleasure. And I would also like to thank to everyone who has joined our session, who even if you joined for a brief period of time, and if you have any comments or thoughts or questions that uh, you would have regarding this session, do feel free to reach out to us and send them in and we could get in touch with Ayushka and we could definitely uh, sort it out for you. And uh, do follow our social media pages platform, which is everystory.sl. And for more content like this, and, uh, and you could also be part of our Young Feminist Network community by signing up in our newsletter, which has different themes for each month, which you can find the link in our bio, in our social media page. And thank you once more for joining. I hope you all have a pleasant evening. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you, you too. Bye.